Hello guys, Kazim here. On this episode of the Tech Talk, I and my guests will be comparing Azure SQL and Azure SQL Manage Instance. We'll talk about when to use one over the other, migration recommendation, and some general Azure SQL best practices. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Let's check it out. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Tech Talk Show with me, Kazim. Uh, today, we're going to be comparing between two data services uh, on Azure, and that's um, Azure SQL Managed Instance and Azure SQL. And uh, for this episode, I'm joined by Denny Cherry uh, to help us make sense of today's topic. You're welcome to the Tech Talk Show, Denny. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate you uh, bringing me on. So, so let's start with uh, letting my audience learn a little bit about you. Who is Danny and what do you do for a living? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about myself, uh, much <laughs> my wife's dismay. Um, so I've been working in IT for yeah, about 25 years now, give or take. Um, I've been a consultant for, uh, I want to say, 12 or 13 of those years now, probably. Um, and I've had my own company, uh, Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting, for uh, about 11 years now. I think we just started our 11th year. Uh, so we've been focusing on SQL Server. So that's where I started my career was as a DBA. Um, everybody that I've got working for me specializes in the database space. And for the most part, we've all branched out into the whole cloud platform in general to some degree. Um, either a couple of our people are just they're still focused on the SQL Server offerings in Azure. Um, then some of us have, have branched out and gotten a lot bigger and wider across the Azure platform. Um, and what I tell my clients, or when, when clients talk to us about what we do in Azure, I tell them basically anything that doesn't involve writing .NET code, we can help you take care of. Um, so a lot of infrastructure work in Azure, um, a lot of architecture work in Azure, um, as well as obviously a lot of database work in Azure, since that's kind of where we where we came from. As basically everybody in the company, except for our BI person, came from a DBA background. Um, so we all kind of grew up grew up from there. So so let's kick things off with similarities now between this uh, SQL product that we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the on-prem SQL that that's been around for some time and that we all know about. And we also have the Azure SQL and Manage Instance. Let's start with similarities first. Sure. So what thing do they all share in common? You want to walk us through this? Um, so between you know between the three products, we have obviously a basically identical code base. Um, so when you talk about Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL Managed Instance, one of the core things to remember, at its core, it's just SQL Server. So anything you can do in traditional on-prem SQL Server, you're going to be able to do in either Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL Managed Instance. So there's going to be a couple of caveats to that. So when you're in Managed Instance, you're not going to be able to do things like file stream or file table um, or DTC to, to some degree. Um, when you're in Azure SQL Database, you know there, there's going to be a couple more limitations of what you can't do, um, but 98% of the, the SQL Server product is available to you in either Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL Managed Instance. Um, so when we're dealing with things like Managed Instance, we've got things like link servers. We can do cross database joins, cross database queries. We can use the use command to jump between databases. All of that stuff works exactly as you would expect it to in an on-prem database. The only real difference is you've got this fully qualified domain name as our uh, connection string or server name, as opposed to just having a local server name uh, to a server on your network. So now let's talk Azure SQL now for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, yes, so we've mentioned the Azure uh, SQL managed instance, and we have the Azure SQL itself as two uh, separate services on Azure. 
So, right. so do you want to help us highlight some key differences between these two? And uh, yes. when is it best to use one over the other? Because you seem to confuse me in person, for instance, <laughs> when do I use the managed SQL instance versus when to use the uh, Azure SQL? Yeah, th there's a lot of confusion as to when you should use one versus the other. Um, a lot of people, like yes. when managed instance came out, a lot of people are like, ooh, this is the new fangled thing. I want to use this. I want to talk about this. Well, that's great in some scenarios. In other scenarios, it's not. Um, so the big differentiator between the two is going to be the fact that with Azure SQL managed instance, it's very much like a traditional on-prem database or a VM database or VM instance, rather, where you can only scale up so much. You can only put so much stuff on it. So as of today, you can only put 100 databases on a single managed instance. And if you buy all the cores that are available to you, you can put, I believe, 16 terabytes of storage on that managed instance. That's it. That's your cap. Um, and you can only have databases that are either four or eight terabytes in size. I don't remember which off the top of my head. With Azure SQL database, though, a lot of those limitations go away. You can have as many databases as you want. They're really, I think the limitation is like 32,000 databases per virtual server name. Um, the size of the databases, there's, if you're not using hyperscale, you're limited to, I believe it's a four terabyte database. Um, but if you want to use hyperscale, you have no effective limitation on how big the database can get. Um, I know Microsoft has tested databases up to 100 terabytes in size in traditional Azure SQL database using hyperscale. So you can get the performance and the scale that you need. So where I where I guide my clients and what I talk to with my clients about the differences between the two is if we can take our application and scale it out, then Azure SQL database is going to be the way to go. If we're looking at a more traditional, kind of more monolithic database, um, that's where putting it in Azure SQL Managed Instance is going gonna, is gonna to be where we want to going to be where we want to land. Um, so what I mean by that is if you've got a, say, a B2B application and you've got one database per business client, that's a great use case for Azure SQL database because you can scale out to huge, huge amounts. Um, so for example, I know for a fact, one of the largest payroll processors in the, in the US, um, they use Azure SQL database for their hosting of their databases. And they do exactly this. They have one database per client of theirs and their clients are obviously all businesses. Um, so they have one database per client that's set up in their platform. So again, they have 30, 40, 50,000 databases in their platform. Um, but this gives them the ability to scale infinitely because it doesn't matter how many clients they add, they can just spin up more databases and Microsoft will just buy more virtual servers and more physical hardware to put in the data center. And Microsoft stays, is able to stay ahead of the curve with their growth planning. So they can just spin up new databases and throw them in their elastic pools and it's extremely cost effective and extremely easy for them to spin up new resources and get these things up and running. Whereas in the SQL managed instance world, we're now dealing with instances, not databases. So we can spin up an instance and we can put 100 databases on there, but we can't scale any more than that. So if we want to scale beyond 100 databases on a managed instance, we have to spin up another managed instance. Now we've got a client that's doing this right now. They're literally just finishing up their migration from on-prem to Azure, and they're up to seven managed instances because they need to be able to throw lots of lots of databases on there. And the way their application is, is designed, they have to be able to do cross database queries within their app. So that took SQL database out of the equation, and then they basically had to go to managed instance. And so they've got a whole lot of managed instance. They've got a whole lot of MI cores, um, but they're able to do what they need to do. They know that there's some caveats that they're going to have around scale because they do have this limitation of 100 databases per MI that they have to deal with.
you've just uh, finished talking to us about the differences between those two Azure products, those two Azure SQL products. But let's talk a little bit now about on-prem migration. So if there's ever a need for a customer, you know, a customer is looking to migrate their on-prem SQL uh, server to Azure. So between these two Azure services, the managed instance and the uh, Azure SQL, which would you recommend? You know, which would you recommend them to go with? And uh, you've been doing this very well. Is there like a cheat sheet that you have somewhere that you want to share with the people that you can learn from? Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a cheat sheet. Um, <laughs> it, it's really a talk to the client and see what their goals of the application are and how much rewriting of the application they're willing to do. Um, if they don't want to do any rewriting of the application and they just need it to work, um, then I tell them, hey, let's just pick it up. Let's put it in managed instance because that's probably where we're going to need to go. I mean, we're going to look at the app. We're going to see what we what technologies we need, what features we need of the MI. But we're probably going to need things like database mail. We're probably going to need SQL agent jobs. We're probably going to need cross database queries. Um, and those things are all going to be on managed instance, not in SQL DB. If the, if the client on the other hand is willing to do some application rewriting, then we can start to look at uh, moving things into uh, Azure SQL DB. Then it can make a lot more sense to go into SQL DB because we can break things apart. We can go, okay, we don't need jobs. We, can, we have other ways we can do that. Uh, we don't need cross database queries. There's other ways we can do that. There's ever, or there's there's either workarounds or we can redesign the apps and not need those requirements, not have those requirements. So there's things we can do to, to work around some of these potential roadblocks, some of these potential problems that we that we can see with the clients. Um, and that's really what one of the first things we look at is it can be how much rewriting of the app are they willing to do, or do they just want to lift and shift this up from from on prem to Azure? Um, and then we figure out how we are going to move it up and how much downtime we can afford to take with the client as to how we're going to actually do that migration up to up to the, the target system. So, so let's try to wrap things up now with some best practices, right? So when it comes to Azure SQL in general, what are some of those best practices you want to leave us with? You want to leave those listening uh, to this with? With regards to licensing, you know, we license our SQL server on-prem. So is it the same? What do we have to do differently when we migrate to Azure SQL, uh, security-wise, and perhaps monitoring? So what are some of those best practices you want to leave us with? Uh, so yes, a, I mean, a lot of what we do when we move up to the cloud is still going to be basically the same we do on-prem. Um, there's going to be a couple of extra things we need to deal with from a security perspective. Um, the first is going to be, uh, do we need public endpoints on our databases? So by default, Azure SQL database is available from the public internet. Do we want it to be? Do we have customers who need to be able to get to the database from the internet? Or can we have all the apps connecting in through the back end through a private IP address? If we can do that, we need to turn off that public IP address. Um, Azure SQL Managed Instance does have the ability to have that public endpoint turned on. When you create a new managed instance, though, it is going to have that endpoint turned off by default. So you can turn it on if you need to. Um, I don't think any of the customers I've set up with a managed instance have had that endpoint uh, fired up and, and connect, available to connect from the public side. Um, all their data they want to keep private, so they don't use that public endpoint because that just takes away the ability for people to come in from the outside. Because if there's no endpoint, we don't have to worry about people coming in from the outside. And then we can just move more towards a tr more traditional uh, security posture that we're working with them that we're dealing with. From, from the, the database maintenance perspective, the database maintenance side of things, um, it's all mostly the same. We still need to rebuild indexes. We need to make sure stats are correct. Um, the automatic index tuning wizard that, that Azure provides as part of Azure SQL DB 
it's okay. It's not great. Um, we've had some problems with it recently with one of our clients. It, it screwed up one of our clients because uh, one of the developers turned it on by accident, and, and you know it, it ended up screwing up a bunch of queries that were specifically using one set of indexes and wasn't giving them the the indexes that that it wanted. So it ended up, it ended up you know causing some headaches. But you know the, these are relatively minor things. Um, and we can usually catch a lot of this stuff in dev before before it gets rolled out to production on those systems. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all the normal maintenance stuff kind of, you know, you have still have to take that into account. Um, the big thing with Azure is remember that different service tiers come with different levels of performance that you're going to have available to you. So business critical and general purpose are going to be the two tiers that are available for either managed instance or Azure SQL database. Those are going to come with different performance levels for your hard drives. So if you're in an application that's pulling lots and lots of data off the hard drive, you're going to want to be very careful about how much IO you have available to you um, in the tier you're in. You might need to bump up to a higher service tier just to get the faster hard drives that are available in that faster service tier, the high, that higher service tier. Um, you'll also get some more availability um, and some additional ability to query stuff. So when you go to the business critical tier, for example, um, specifically in managed instance, this is extremely handy. Um, you can pass in application intent equals read only, and you can actually run queries against your your availability group secondary, which you're getting as part of the cost of having a business critical managed instance. So one of our customers actually does this right now. They've got the, the customer that has seven MIs. Um, two of them are set up as uh, business critical specifically so they can have this feature. And they're then able to resell that feature to their clients. And they go to their customers and say, hey, if you want the ability to run queries on this server, um, pass in application intent equals read only and run whatever queries you want because that's going against the secondary. And you, you, can, you can do whatever you want. You're not going to impact your production environment if you do that. So they, they can do a lot of really cool stuff in that way. And, and getting their customers access to it. And it's an additional revenue stream for that customer that they've been able to take advantage of and use very successfully. Thank you very much, Denny. But, but I don't want us to leave without talking about your new book coming up, right? You have a new book coming up soon. So you want to tell us a little bit about this book? Uh, yeah, so I do. So uh, it's called, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my other screen over here, so I'm looking sideways, sorry. Because <laughs> I don't want to name the book right. Uh, the book is called Enterprise Grade IT Security for Small and Medium Businesses. Um, so the idea behind the book was to write, that I want to write something, not necessarily for, for us, the folks that actually like have fingers on keyboards and are doing the work. But I want to write a book more geared towards the upper management level that doesn't necessarily know what all these different features are and why all these different features are in the enterprise and how to get a lot of these features for their smaller businesses. Because, you know, big companies, giant companies, they have people that do this. Smaller companies do not. They have to rely on their C levels or their their higher their their higher level management folks to actually understand somewhat of what's going on, and actually to make the right decisions on what to implement and what to buy, um, and then to bring in somebody to actually implement it. So that was the idea I had when I was writing the book. Was I was gearing it towards not necessarily the people that do the work, but the people that make the decisions, so they can not necessarily know what to do, but they know what questions to ask of the people that are actually going to do the work. Because they're probably gonna bring in somebody and go, hey, implement this thing for me. And they're trusting that that person knows what they're doing. But the executive needs to know, all right, what do I actually need to buy? And why do I or don't I need to have this thing? And that's kind of the the idea I was, I was going to, to try to, when I was writing the book. Um, so if you want to find the book, go to Amazon, search for Enterprise IT Security, scroll down a little bit. It's the bright green one. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean when you, when you find the cover for it. 
I was questioning the color choice until I saw it on Amazon. I was like, okay, yeah, I understand why it's bright green and super easy to see. Um, and <laughs> the, yeah, the color will pop out. It's it's the one that looks like it needs batteries to run the cover. Um, that's how bright green it is. Um, so it's so supposed to be available sometime in late 2022. Um, the, the date on Amazon keeps changing. I have done all my editing and all my reviews. It's gone <laughs> to typesetting as far as I know. Um, so it should be ready to be published hopefully any day now. But I know you can pre-order it on Amazon um, and have it have it shipped to you uh, just as soon as, as soon as they get their hands on it. Thank you very much, Daniel. Hopefully, once uh, you know the book is out there, we can have like a recap to walk us through like a, a snippet of what you have in the book. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love that. So uh, here it's where we're going to call it a wrap on today's episode of the Tech Talk. Uh, so if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe. So it's the uh, Tech Talk uh, with Kazim on YouTube. So you can have a rewatch of this one and previous episode uh, up on the channel. I just want to share, Danny, before we say bye bye now. Uh, no, that's that's pretty much all I've got. Uh, if anybody has any questions for me, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can hit me at uh, www.dcac.com um, or you can email me, uh, denny at dcac.com. I love to get questions. I love to talk to you more about how, how things are going with your Azure migrations or if you need some help getting things out Azure, migrated to Azure. Sorry, I can't talk today. Um, be more than happy to help you out with those. All right. So it's a wrap now. It's a bye-bye from myself and Denny, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.